I'm Professor Sid Morris, the author of the online book Topology Without Tears, which is freely available at www.topologywithouttears.net. This is the first of a series of videos on writing proofs in mathematics, and it supplements my book Topology Without Tears. One of the most important parts of pure mathematics is writing proofs. I will not pretend that this video will make writing proofs easy. This is because some statements are indeed easy to prove and others are hard to prove. This video, or rather this series of videos, aims to help make it easy for you to write easy proofs. However, only with practice will you find it easy to write easy proofs. So it is up to you to get lots of practice. And this practicing cannot be done the night before an exam. In my book, Topology Without Tears, there is a large number of exercises for you to practice on. Very often, a student will be asked to prove some statement, and she or he will say, I have no idea where to start. In this video, you will certainly learn how to start a proof. You will also see one easy proof and see that writing it is indeed easy. The first thing we must do is understand what we mean in mathematics by a proof or that a statement is proved. The way the term proof is used in mathematics is very different from how it is used in other contexts. Let us look how the term is used in the law. Consider the scenario. Joe and Fred appear in court over a dispute. Joe claims that he lent Fred a thousand dollars and Fred has not repaid the money. Fred claims that Joe lent him only five hundred dollars and he has repaid the money in full. Each presents his evidence to the court and at the end the court decides in favour of Joe. Joe leaves the court a happy man and says the court decision proved what he claimed was true. Actually this is not so. The court merely decided that on the balance of probabilities it was more likely that Joe's claim was true than Fred's claim was true. So it is not a proof but merely more likely. So that is one usage of the term proof in the context of civil law. But now let's consider criminal law. After the court case, Joe and Fred have a long disagreement in public. An hour later, Joe is walking down the street and a man comes running up to him, stabs him with a knife and runs off. There are two witnesses who later identify Fred as the killer. The police arrest Fred as he has motive, opportunity and there were two trustworthy witnesses. In court, Fred has no alibi. The jury is satisfied that the case against Fred is proved beyond reasonable doubt and finds him guilty. That is proof in the context of criminal law. It however turns out that Fred has a twin brother, an identical twin, and he saw how upset Fred was at the civil law case and took matters into his own hands and murdered Joe. So that is one use of the term proof in the context of the law, at least in English law that I am familiar with. This differs greatly from its usage in mathematics. Now let us turn to science and consider how the term proof is used in that context. To prove a scientific theory, scientists carry out an experiment or a series of experiments 
under specific conditions to show that the experimental results agree with those predicted by the theory. And their results must be able to be replicated by other scientists carrying out the same experiment or experiments under the same conditions. If this can be done and the experimental results are consistent with the theory, the theory is said to be proved. For hundreds of years, Newtonian mechanics was regarded as being proved. But at about the turn of the 20th century, it began to appear that a fact which seemed obviously true and consistent with Newtonian mechanics was not true. It was that if the speed of one object is A and the speed of another object going in the opposite direction is B, then the relative speed of the two objects is A plus B. In particular, this was found not to be true if A is the speed of light. What resulted in 1905 was Albert Einstein's theory of special relativity, which explained why these speeds cannot be added. How wrong this addition of speeds is becomes obvious as the speeds approach the speed of light. So Newtonian mechanics was found not to be true, but rather a very good approximation at low speeds. So the term proof in science means rather less than what many people think it does. Albert Einstein was acutely aware of this and said, no amount of experimentation can ever prove me right. A single experiment can prove me wrong. The use of the term proof in science is very different from its use in mathematics. Having now emphasised that proof has a special meaning in mathematics, different from that in everyday use or in law or even in science, let us at last look at proof in the context of pure mathematics. As I said in my first YouTube video on pure mathematics, in pure mathematics you begin with a set of axioms. If we are studying Euclidean geometry, we start with Euclid's axioms and can prove, for example, that the sum of the angles in any triangle is 180 degrees. If we are studying a non-Euclidean geometry, then we begin with different axioms, and the sum of the angles of any triangle may not be 180 degrees. Indeed, in projective geometry, we cannot even talk about angles, because angles are not preserved by projective transformations. So the first thing we learn is that in pure mathematics we have to be very careful to understand our starting point. That is, understand what information we are given. In pure mathematics we start with a set of axioms. From these axioms we use logic to prove lemmas, propositions and theorems. And the proofs need to be watertight arguments. What does a proof look like? A proof should start with the facts that we are given. A proof should end with what we are required to prove. In between these two, there should be a series of sentences. Yes, sentences, each with a subject and a verb. So let us have a look at the steps in writing a proof in pure mathematics. Step 1. Write down what we are given. Step 2. Write down the definition 
of each technical term in what we are given. Step 3. Write down what we are required to prove. Step 4. Write down the definition of each technical term in what we are required to prove. So these four steps are quite easy, quite straightforward. The next step is not as easy. Step 5. Think. Let us look at an example. Prove that a topological space is discrete if every singleton subset is open. Proof. Step 1. What are we given? We're given, let x be a topological space such that for each x in x, the singleton x is an open set. Step 2. Write down the definitions of each technical term in what we're given. Well, we could write down the definition of a topological space, but I'll take that as known. So the other is a subset of a topological space X tor is said to be open if it is a member of tor. So we can now rewrite what we are given. We're given, let X be a topological space, such that for each X in X, the singleton set X is in tall. Step 3. What are we required to prove? We're required to prove, or RTP, X tall is a discrete space. Step 4 is to write the definition of each technical term in what we're required to prove. By definition, XTOR is a discrete space if and only if every subset of X is open. So we can rewrite what we are required to prove. RTP, if S is any subset of X, then S belongs to TOR. Step 5 is to think. We have to somehow look at what we're required to prove, namely S is in TOR, and use what we're given, namely the singleton sets X are in TOR. But we note that S is the union of the singleton sets X as X runs through all members of S. Further, by the definition of a topology, the union of any number of open sets is open. As we are given that X is in Tor, it then follows that the union of the singleton sets X, X as X runs over the members of S, is a union of open sets, and so is in Tor. But what is the union of X for X and S? It's just the set S. So S is in Tor, which is what we are required to prove. So that is how you use the steps to get a proof. In conclusion, we see that steps 1 to 4 are easy. So there's no reason for you ever to say you cannot start a proof. Step 5 is to think. I have been influenced by Professor Brian Davey of La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia, who produced a booklet called When is a Proof?